for those following from Europe and good morning for those connecting from the US. This podcast will feature today Dr. Kyle Allison and will focus on a key topic related to the digitalization and its connection to the physical retail. The discussion will delve into the dynamic relationship between digital and physical aspects of retail. It will explore how digital technologies influence and complement the in-person shopping experience. This conversation aims to uncover the ways in which digital, uh, the digital sphere enhances and interacts with the physical touch points and analyzes the resulting effects on both brands and customer. My guest, Dr. Kyle Allison, is a seasoned expert in digital strategy. Uh, Dr. Allison's professional, academic, and personal passion lies in all things digital. With nearly two decades of experience in the fields of digital marketing, e-commerce, and digital analytics, he possesses the acumen to lead digital teams, teach, develop in higher education material, and I believe that today he's recognized as a subject matter and an expert in the field. And I am sure that his expertise will provide valuable insight into this intricate relationship between digital and physical touch points in the modern retail. And I'm eager to learn more about that, Kyle. How are you? <laughs> Great. Thanks for the introduction. That was fantastic. I'm I'm so happy that. that we're doing this together. So really, I mean, like meeting with people across the globe is always right. enriching. And I want to learn more about you and your experience. Absolutely. Well, the first thing that you said about, you know, connecting with people in the, the field around the world, it, it goes to show that, you know, while there's some local business dynamics in a global sense, digital is just that as humans, we all have similar behaviors and characteristics that allow us to look at how people shop, what people are doing. So I love that connect with other people like yourself globally. So first off, thanks for having me here. Um, and I'm really excited. And uh, this is like the core of my passion of a topic, by the way. So I'm, this is a, right up my alley of, of, of interest to talk about, not just experience. Um, yeah, like you said, I have two decades of experience um, in digital marketing, uh, primarily in, in retail, corporate retail. I've worked for Best Buy, Dick Sporting Goods. And most recently, I was the vice president uh, omnichannel marketing, which was primarily digital marketing, e-commerce, and some aspects of digital to the brick and mortar environment. Um, for the Army and Air Force Exchange, so any U.S. Uh, Army or Air Force base has a, a store called the Exchange, and we're like a Walmart Target, uh, except for they are tax-free, and it's only for military members and their families to shop. But the same dynamics and challenges of, of any other retailer we were faced with, except in a very core audience. Um, so I've, I've got a pretty de a decent background with a lot of major retailers here in the U.S. Um, and I've seen a lot uh, happen in the last, you know, 15 or so years, especially with the emergence of digital. And I think when it comes to this topic, what really resonates with me is that as e-commerce grew, right, especially post-pandemic, we're looking at an environment today, though, where customers, yes, start to feel more comfortable going back into store. Um, but when we looked at how customers had to shop only online or a very or a very limited availability to go into stores and find products they were looking for. Digital really rose as not just a nice to have, but a need for a lot of retail organizations mm -hmm. to get up to speed with their technology. So I think, you know, some retailers had it done, had it done well. Um, they were ready for the pandemic, even though you didn't want it to happen, but they had the digital channels capable, right? They had curbside pickup as an as an option prior to the pandemic. And then once the pandemic happened, as an example, curbside pickup just started to pop up everywhere because yeah. nobody wanted to go into stores. Curbside pickup as a fulfillment option and a shopping online, as an example, kind of elevated itself to be a need, not just a nice to have for customers anymore. It was like, I need this as an option. If you don't have it, retailer X, I'm going to go to retailer Y because I don't feel comfortable going inside stores. And I don't quite frankly have time to wait for this to be shipped in two or three days from online. So I've got to go into an environment where I feel comfortable, which is my car, and go curbside pickup. So that's, you know, the area where I feel like some retailers had to catch up a little bit and understand yeah. what does this curbside thing mean? So I think in today's environment, we're seeing a lot of retailers um, still playing catch up, some doing it well, but learned a lot though about how to make it a convenient channel of curbside pickup. I'm just using curbside as an example, but the, the aspects of today's environment is very much that these things we thought was a nice to have for customers, Prior to the pandemic, today it's a must-have. Customers' expectations have risen in these options, right? Um, one thing I always talk about too is the fundamentals of, of, of marketing. 
product, price, promotion, and placement, the four Ps. Well, that's still a core staple. We have to have those intact to market to customers digitally and even in store. But what matters more now is elevating that with convenience and care, right? And 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 more of that, you know, I care about you because as a consumer, I'm going to give you multiple options, digital opportunity to connect them with online and in store, right? Allow mm-hmm. those options to exist because some customers want the ability even today, you know, like we call it post pandemic, I think we're out of it. Um, curbside option is still a necessary thing for some customers. Buy online pickup in store is still a necessity for some customers because they just got used to it during the pandemic and they expect yes. it now. So the four P's of marketing do not just uh, exist as the only thing we got to focus on in today's environment. We have to fulfill digital touch points, digital options for our customers to really allow them to feel connected with with the retailers that they that they consume with. So a long story short, I think what, what I'm getting at is that we're in a new playing field now with new expectations where the nice to haves before are now a must have in the retail environment. Right. And I believe that, of course, technology was already uh, picking up, but it has uh, shifted the way uh, consumers interact with retailers, uh, especially uh, during the pandemic when everyone had to depend on that. So yeah. let's let's take that point uh, as a starting point. Uh, and, and if I may ask, how was the rise of digital technology um, a, a main point into influencing the way consumers interact with physical spaces? And what are some of the key changes you've observed in recent years? Like you, 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 you have spoken about uh, the curbside uh, as, as a main uh, observation. What are the other observations that you might have looked at uh, in the past years? Yeah, so I think uh, mobile obviously growing as we know, the last you know even ten years has been a channel that's grown over time with the usage of the mobile phone, not just to browse and shop, but I think connect. I think having some shopability with your mobile app as a retailer is important mm. in store. Scanless checkout might be an option. You're seeing that pop up, you know, a little bit more like Amazon's doing it. You don't even have to have a cashier, right? It's not even just cashierless checkout. It's truly just having the ability to have the app on your phone, walk into a store and then just kind of walk out because they charge your, they ping it from your, your phone directly. That technology is emerging. And I did it for the first time a couple of years ago in the airport. And I felt, it felt weird not having at least to go to a self-checkout to scan the product and put in my credit card, right? I think that technology is emerging because customers want as seamless as possible. I yes. think there's an adoption though that a lot of customers are gonna have to go through as far as trusting it, that it works. You know, um, retailers are going to have that trust aspect, too. I think retailers especially are looking at, can we do this in a physical environment and still have the ability to manage the security aspect of it, right? Can we still have a scanless checkout without a, even, a, even a, 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 a kiosk where people want to still physically scan their product and put in their credit card, just do it from a phone, an app? With that security aspect, can we, can we manage it from a technology perspective, but also street perspective? I've heard mm-hmm. some uh, industry experts say that the hesitancy of some is that can we can we minimize you know stealing from our store? Will this really work? Can we really capture the sale at the point of sale? So I think a lot of what it comes down to is the trust factor of the technology, and just as humans, can we trust that we're going to be able to capture these goods being sold through these kind of uh, what we call scan to pay kind of uh, technologies because it's a very new territory that really is not it's not as as dominant as right now we have um cashierless checkout that's kind of been around for several years now but when that came out even like seven or eight years ago that was being scrutinized right like no cashier no physical person to, yes. to swipe the goods yeah well, yeah well that's kind of dominant now that's expected you see that in almost every store so this new wave of technology i think will be adopted But it's a lot, there's a little more risk there that has to be taken into account. So I think customers want the convenience and the seamless shopping experience, but retailers, the risk assessment is really what what they're doing with that technology. Mm. 
And we're seeing that um, technology was always connected to a mobile device or mm -hmm. something remote that we cannot see, but that could impact our shopping experience. More and more in the context of physical retail, we're looking at digital support within the touch point. We're seeing, as you mentioned earlier, uh, lots of digital cashier desks or maybe scanners that give us information about products or mm -hmm. uh, magic mirrors or digital uh, screens, etc. So how, how do you think that um, this integration is helping um, physical retail or bricks and mortar stores regain uh, some of their um, I don't know if we're saying glory days or sure. more of their positive experiences. It, it, it's maybe helping with the retention, the metric of customer retention, right? Because I think, yeah. you know, it, you know, we can acquire a customer with some great marketing, a great product and a great price, right? We can draw someone into a store with a great deal. But like I said, that's the fundamental of retail. Mm. It's a great price, great product. But once I bring them in and give them a great experience, we all know the experience is what really matters and differentiates one retailer over others. So like I said, the scanless kind of checkout with your phone is just one example. You know, the phone device was primarily used as an advertising outlet. Let's, you know, send a push notification on the app, but talk about a great deal, then go in store. Or we'll geo-target somebody in the radius of the store and bring them in with an advertisement. Well, it's beyond that now. When you talk about the digital funnel and the shopping funnel, we can have way more touch points, like you said, of interaction through that funnel to get them to check out and convert, which I love. I mean... Advertising at the top of the funnel is great, but really what our jobs are as digital strategists is to bring them through the funnel to buy. So yes, if we can do the showroom effect where you can you know, show that if you're in a furniture store as an example, how does it look in my room? How can I take that showroom, virtual showroom from the store to what it looks like in my house as an example? How can I scan, you're right, a barcode and get product information or even price compare, right? I mean, there's plenty of apps out there that do price comparisons. I mean, I could walk into a, I don't want to say the names out loud, X store and see what it sells for either online or another store. I mean, yes. you want that environment to stay in store, but you want to give all the different shopping behavior triggers of your customers that ability to do it, whether it's a showroom effect, pricing, product information. Um, and, you know, nowadays you see more QR codes out there where, you know, the QR code on the shelf is a great way to go to the website to read about it and look at the enriched content of e-commerce. So that's an awesome um, content marketing play because on the shelf, you only have so much space to talk about your product. So unless it's on an end cap on a large display, that product in the middle of the aisle only has the box and the packaging to really sell itself. So mm -hmm. if you can do a QR code to bring them to the e-commerce website, which has the videos, the product reviews, all that enriched content, that's another way I see of being connected as well. So content marketing and digital is even more connected now than ever before with the ability to use the phone to scan a QR code to go to a website. Um, and some companies use it as a conversion technique as well. Maybe they'll yeah. buy it off their phone or they're using it just for more product information. But we've got to look at the funnel and figure out where are those interactive touch points with the mobile device, especially because everybody's on it and wants to even use it as they're shopping nowadays. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is really interesting. It shows us that there are these cases uh, where brands think the entire customer journey from the online to the offline and vice versa. And there are uh, other examples where the shopping experience could like stay in a very physical context with the aid of technology. But with this increased popularity of online shopping, how can digital initiatives enhance the overall uh, in-store experience and keep customers engaged when they physically when they visit the physical store. Why am I asking this? Because sometimes we have the tendency to believe or feel even that with all of these push uh, or funneled um, uh, journeys that we're, we're leading customers into, we might have uh, customers who are inclined to buy once because it was convenient, but then not come again to the store. So have you had any uh, cases uh, similar to those? Oh, yeah. So I think, you know, it's a matter of when you identify that I'm ready as a retailer to do this technology, right? Mm -hmm. And any of the examples we just talked about, you know, it works because you'll have that one time touch point or a set of one time touch points from that single purchase from a customer. You still have to go back to the, the fundamentals of strategy of retention. So what you do is you still offer the incentives to come back. 
-hmm. right? You still offer the marketing approach, digital marketing approach to say personalization matters, right? So do the fundamental personalization techniques where you see someone who uses the scanless checkout or you see someone use the, the QR code to provide information. Maybe if I can actually send them a personalized option. Hey, I saw you use a QR code on this product. You didn't purchase it. If I can correlate that to analytics and mm -hmm. come back to them with a follow-up, you know, push notification, text message, email marketing campaign, if they subscribe with that offer to say, hey, you scanned this in store the other day. Hi, Kyle, you scanned this pair of shoes. Do you want to buy it? Here's a 10% off coupon. So we can go back to how do you do the, the marketing aspect of strategy and promotions to, to bring them back in? Because now we have actually more data about our customers too and how they shop and how yeah. they prefer to get information. Use those triggers as not just we're supplying it in that moment, remarket to them, retarget them with the things we know about them even more with these behavior triggers that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And with this, notion of customer centricity in that omni-channel context. I believe that every time uh, we have to lead on a conversation, uh, retail and data cannot be any more disconnected, right? right? I mean, if we don't have that um, rich information and relevant information, we cannot take uh, informed decisions uh, to create like the relevant experiences. But Kyle, Experience and experience is very much different when the context differs. I mean, are there different types of digital experiences leading to physical when we move from luxury to mass products? Are there different concepts of applications from that industry to the other? I think there's some fundamental ones that exist for every type of product and retailer. I mean, the, the basics of, you know, enriched content, you know, allowing, you know, a customer to go in do a QR code or scan a barcode to get great content. I mean, content's great. However, though, obviously with luxury items or more detailed products that need more information, just like now you would you would want that customer to have more information available so they can make their decision. Impulse mm. buying, grocery, the needs types products, probably don't need as much information as just seamless checkout. So I think it's a matter of, you know, identifying which level of digital technology you need. I also think though, it, uh, it's going back like to the data. Once you assess the data of the behavior of your customers, you kind of look at how long does it take for them to convert, right? And do a, and do a good old-fashioned basket analysis too. Find out mm -hmm. what they are buying in the physical environment from that digital kind of innovation that you're doing. Are, are you influencing new purchases, upsells, cross-sells? What, what they're buying kind of matters because your innovation of digital touch points in store market for in-store um, you know, experiences kind of goes down to what are you trying to influence them to do? Are you trying to get them just to buy a product? Are you looking to upsell, cross-sell? And that also dictates the type of um, technology that you're looking to influence as well, right? Yeah. Um, I think like for the lower end products, if you will, or everyday items, great upsell, cross-sell opportunities to have them buy more stuff, right? And so how to cross-market that in the moment? You know, you're down one aisle, but if you know from a basket analysis with what who buys this with what, you can trigger them say, go down to aisle six. Hey, by the way, you got your, you know, I want the, the classic study of what is most often bought with diapers. People will say formula. People will say baby clothes. No, it's actually beer. A good old fashioned study done a long time ago has, has said, I use this example all the time in my classes that I teach, by the way, that people think when you cross market uh, diapers, you're going to have to market to them formula, baby clothes, whatever. No, it's oh actually the dad. It, it's the study, the study, real study. And I, can't remember the source, but it's a classic one. It's a dad getting off work, getting a call from his wife, saying, stop by the store, I need diapers. And the dad's like, well, I might as well pick up a six pack of my favorite beer at the yeah. same time. So why not use digital technology as an example, very straight example to say, you're in the baby aisle diapers. I know you're a dad for whatever reason, based off this, I'm going to ping you with something to go now to aisle six to get your beer, right? It's that kind of lower, narrow funnel thinking that we can absolutely do if we do it right. But the challenge is, though, the challenge for retailers is the investment and all that good stuff, but also the speed of which to be able to do it. So the thing that really challenges us is that speed to do it at every single touch point and communication. So you need good automation, you need good analytics, and the analytics will will fuel the strategiz strategization because you have to prioritize. Mm -hmm. um, these technologies are vast. There's so many different things you can do in this environment of physical with digital touch points, but you have to find what really works for your retailer. So whether you're higher end 
A lower end, it kind of depends. Um, and it depends on what you're trying to do. Higher end, you can still upsell and cross sell, but I think it's more of a challenge because in uh, higher end luxurious items, you're not really look, worrying about the cross sell as much or upsell the recommendation as much as you're just trying to sell that product because there's a lot of you know uh, decision making that a customer has to do in that moment of a higher end item. So the digital touch point is really about that item, whereas in a grocery store or a lower end product, eh, they're going to buy their beer. Just go tell them it's available. Tell them there's a sale. There's a promotion. Look at the consumer behavior influences and bring that, bring those fundamentals back to what you're doing with the technology. And to challenge the idea of uh, data, the importance of data and mm -hmm. data analysis, we love collecting data and analyzing them. But do you believe that in these current contexts, um, digitally collected data might be skewed and do we have to marry it up with um, insights like real qualitative analysis coming from the store itself uh, are customers always honest in the way they behave when they're using technology i mean i'm intrigued like <laughs> yeah no i get because um i always call it that the best digital marketing and digital retail experiences is a marriage between quantitative and qualitative data right um, and if you have it, you got to merge the two together and look at it from that perspective. So when I teach analytics or data science, that's why I tell my students when I'm in the workplace, that's how I guide my analyst team is like, you can't look at just one type of data or analyze just quantitative because you're looking at sales, you're looking at, you know, you're looking at revenue and profit and unit volume and all that stuff, but it doesn't, it's not always an indicator of affinity or satisfaction mm -hmm. of the experience. So then do the either follow-up survey and do that qualitative assessment of the survey, or just go do a focus group, go talk to customers in person, get the right sample size, do all the right things with research, but put the two together, right? You know, some customers may say they loved that opportunity in store to get that trigger of a digital, whatever it was, or opportunity to scan and check out whatever um, you're doing. But I think it's a matter of, did they find it convenient or did they just did it because they felt like they had to, right? Mm -hmm. There's this element to say some customers, if that's the only option they're given, then that's just it. But if you give them multiple options on how to interact with us as a retail brand digitally, then, then talk about it. Do the survey, mm -hmm. do the focus group, and figure it out, and then marry the two together, right? Because right. again, high sales does not always equal customer satisfaction. Yeah. Customer satisfaction is an indicator of truly, do they find that added value of their experience? And again, there's so many different ways you can do that, but get to that qualitative insight, because that's really what's going to tell you if it's working or not. Now, and internally, we want the, the sales and the profitability, yes, but imagine if you made your customers happier, how much more sales and profit you're going to make to enrich these digital experiences, modify them, or sometimes try it and shut it off. There's absolutely, I think, nothing wrong with trying something out in a retail store and pilot it, by the way. I mean, one of the best practices of digital innovation in stores, especially mm -hmm. if you're a large uh, retail chain, you don't have to do them in all stores right away. Pilot your yeah. best stores, sample size them do the analytics, prove a point, a concept, and if it doesn't work, don't do it. Don't implement it across all of your, your chain. I feel like some uh, sometimes I feel like retail companies feel like I have to go all in and you know innovate this digital thing in all my stores. You don't really have to. You can right. test it. And yeah. once you test it, prove a concept, then you roll it out. Because that saves your investment, by the way, too. Uh, testing is the best way to uh, to really look at the budget and figure out can I do this or not. Right. And this would lead to my next question. I mean, do we always have to, maybe in today's omnichannel context, when we have different types of uh, formats, such as our uh, digital, our physical, our ephemeral or seasonal, you name it, do we always have to implement the same strategies uh, within all of our touch points? Or do we have to preserve sometimes the integrity of the touch point by keeping some very much digital and others very much physical? I think um, there are variables at play. So I think you absolutely consider, you know, well, first thing, go back to testing, the fundamentals of that. Don't do that during Q4, mm. right? You know, you get a lot of you get a lot of data, lots of in-store traffic, but that's just organic. People are going to go into stores during Black Friday, Cyber Week, no matter what, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to look at, you know, testing something out, do it in an off-peak season, and a little bit like maybe Q2, when it's like back-to-school season for some retailers, as an example. And right now is a great time to test something you want to try out for Q4 because you're getting a lot of foot traffic, but you're not at the volatility of did it really pay off or not. So I just mm -hmm. want to make that, that comment up front. 
Um, but really, I think what it matters is you have to focus on what is your priority first? What is your objective, right? The fundamentals of that. Your objective, depending if you want that foot traffic to be retention and more sales from the repeated customers, which I think in today's retail environment is really critical. Always tie it back to the objective. If the objective warrants you to do it, you know, off season versus on season, then do it, right? Because maybe you have a lull in your Q4 from last year trying to improve from upon, right? I mean, like when stores opened back up a lot back in 2022, more stores opened back up, you know, for peak holiday shopping. Um, it's like, what were, what are your, what is your goal? Are you trying to comp last year's sales? So really going to comping last year's sales, maybe you actually really hit it hard with those digital touch points during that time of year to increase that foot traffic to, to comp your sales. But if you're looking for a, an even kind of trend and you want to build that trend for the, for the entire fiscal year, then yeah, you want to do it kind of throughout the year very equi equitably, if that makes sense, right? Um, you know, because the power of digital, you can turn it off, you can turn it on. I think though, if you're doing a very core digital experience in store for your customers, it's not prudent to turn it off if they're really used to it. If it's a very common shopping mechanism that they're doing, yeah. obviously don't turn it, don't turn it off because that's going to turn off people. It's going to make them think, well, why this was a what great happened? convenient. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. But if, and that and that's if you're like in a lot of stores. If you're testing something, well, maybe that one or two store locations you're doing it in versus the hundred you have, a little bit different. But I think it's about grooming your customers and you're influencing them and you're and you're really training your customers, right? I had one executive that I worked with say, you know, we're training our customers. And you really kind of are, right? Once you have that available. Um, and once you start getting more of them using it. So and if they start if they're starting to adopt it. You don't want to lose that adoption phase because that's where the S curve comes in. You don't want to lose that momentum. Right. It's really interesting how you put it. And I was thinking also about like my upcoming question. <laughs> and you're giving me that inspiration. I mean, today we're talking about that brand, brand objectives, uh, brand retention rates, and it all comes down to the brand's identity. So how do you see the relationship between digital and physical touch points impacting the brand identity and perception? And in today's world, are there any challenges brands might face in maintaining that consistency across both realms? I mean, it's always very simple for us to think about it, to write it on pen and paper. But when we come to the actual uh, phase of doing things, like this is a total mess, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, I, I always talk about in, in basic digital strategy or strategy in general, execution is, that's the make or break point, right? The plan is yes. great, but yeah. the reality sets in. So I think from a brand perspective, I'll put it into two different buckets. The brand of the retailer and then the brand of actual product brands. For the brand of the retailer, it's a challenge if you're just now, like literally now or recently getting into a strong digital environment in store. Because if you have been known by the masses that you sell to for being a primarily e-commerce driven website and you didn't pay much attention to your stores, look what happened not too long ago. We'll just say it, Bed Bath & Beyond. Look what happened to Toys R Us. Look what happened. Look at some of these retailers that we thought were so strong and they had a decent in-store experience. Don't get me wrong, um, but they didn't connect to their, their e-commerce or digital environment very well. And that was part of their demise, part of it. And they had other reasons, I'm, I know, but you would think these brands of retail brands that existed for so long in Sears, God bless. I mean, yeah, that's the classic role model of not what not to do. Sorry, Sears. Um, but that's true because they closed down all of their department stores for no digital experience whatsoever in their stories. I'm sorry, they did nothing innovative. And they still have a website up though today. What I'm saying is if you were never known for having any aspect of digital experience at all in your stores, and then you start to try to do it, that that's gonna be ch more challenging for you to catch up. Mm -hmm. So as a brand of a retailer, um, that brand equity is really important. Now you can, if you do it right, like Best Buy did a turnaround in 2013, 2014. Best Buy was, they were looking at Best Buy, right? And I was there during this time, actually. Well, were they going to be the next circuit city or not? Were they going to be the next circuit city that closed down because of lack of great experiences and innovation? Well, Hubert Jolie, fantastic CEO, came in, turned around Best Buy because he looked at, how can I bring in-store experiences now with the digital environment? He brought in kiosks of you know Samsung, other major uh, brands that have an expert in store, 
but have an engaging kind of kiosk and like display of digital interactiveness for customers. And that was one of the key reasons that the in-store experience of Best Buy turned around. And today they're still doing very well, which is great. I love Best Buy, nothing but great things about them uh, to say. And um, so where I'm going with this is you have to still keep that momentum. You may not be the first to market as a retailer to do something digital, but your brand as a, hey, do I identify as a customer with a retailer or not? Most people, if you assess them and or survey them, I'm going, I'm sure going to tell you that they identify with retailers who have a great digital experience in store or some way to connect with me digitally, right? That's where I'm going to. Whereas a brand of a retailer today that doesn't have any kind of um, equity whatsoever or a reputation for that, it's going to be really hard to catch up. Mm -hmm. Not saying you can't do it. You're just going to have to figure out a, a really good differentiator or do it in a way that really works for your customers to bring them into your stores. Um, now it's about brands for products. It depends. Uh, it's uh, such a, uh, a lazy answer, I know, but it depends because, you know, if you're a direct-to-consumer store with a direct-to-consumer direct brand, you know, that one challenge is being direct-to-consumer. If you're selling to a mass retailer, you know, it just depends what your product, quite frankly, is. I, I, again, we go back to luxury versus lower-end everyday items. There's a lot of dynamics there already. So it's a, that's actually a really good question to assess, actually. I'm not sure the best answer other than, you know, still any brand can still benefit from a great digital experience in store. Now, the type right. of brand or product, it, it really does depend. But I think mm. from a retail brand perspective, yeah, it's what I just said in the, in the former part. Interesting. Thank you. Anyway, uh, it's an ongoing uh, topic. There is no um, black or white. And I yeah, believe exactly. it's very personal to each and every brand. Mm -hmm. But now on the customer side, how do these digital enhancements to the physical retail experience affect their behaviors, expectations, and maybe the overall satisfaction? Are these uh, are there anyway, uh, generational differences in how customers respond to changes? We, we've been been praising for for so long like the gen zers the future of of digital you know who lies in their hands but i've seen my mom going digital at some point <laughs> and she was very like anti-digital and we've seen many other people uh, who were pretty much novices adopt technology learn and grow with it so we've culturally learned to acquire some know-how related to technology and now it's like our next normal but what say you about about that uh, yeah Kyle? i think it's fair to say that the younger generation who grew up with technology in school in life i mean there's kids now with cell phones that you know, my, I'll be, for example, my daughter's 11, okay? I, and we gave her her first cell phone last year at the age of 10, but she had friends at the age of seven, eight having cell phones. And I just, I, I guess I waited longer than most parents to give her one at 10. Some may say that's still too young, whatever. But she only uses the text, call. Um, she's not doing any shopping on there, of course. YouTube, I got a lot of strict, uh, strict rules on there. I'm a very strict parent on the phone. But here's what I'm saying. It's a natural thing to say that the younger audience and my daughter growing up at her age and the, the 20s and 30s of the, of the world are, they grew up with technology. So there's no reason not to, to have the foundational idea that they understand how to adapt to it a little bit quicker at times. It doesn't mean though at all that any other generation can adapt to technology, right? So, and some may actually adapt to it quicker in retail than the younger audience. Because here's why retailers have always adapted to all generations, but the older generation grew up with the in-store environment, mm -hmm. right? So my thing is that people who are in any generation, especially uh, let's say there's some there's some breakoff point here. Let's say anybody in the generation X and above generation, they grew up with the in-store environment. And when the internet came out, e-commerce, they had to adapt to that, right? Now it's for everybody. Everybody has understands e-commerce and, and, and most people understand that e-commerce and in-store are two different, Two different sales channels, but to connect them together, though, I think the older generation thrives and wants an in-store experience more than the younger generation, quite frankly. So I think it's more of a challenge, actually, for the younger generation on some aspect in some commodities to want them to bring them to the store because they always found the online shopping to be more convenient and they're yes. used to it. So I think, you know, we can't think of the in-store environment being easier for the younger audience because they know technology better. It's actually the other way. I think it's going to be harder to get the younger audience in store because they're so used to the convenience of digital. And so yeah. the older generation may just find the adoption of how to use this technology a little bit 
I would say slower, but just not as fast. But they're going to actually enjoy it more because they like to go in stores. And that's what mm-hmm. they did. They went to mm-hmm. the malls on the weekend. They went to the department stores as a kid, right? So I think it's it's the, the way we need to think about it is just that, that we can't assume because someone's more savvy in technology in any generation is going to automatically go into store. They're going to stay with where they're at with the technology. So those who love the in-store experience are going to actually probably prefer, hey, this digital thing's cool. Let me go inside stores now because that's what I grew up with. That's what I'm used to. And I trust going in person to see the product, touch it, feel it, right? I like to interact with humans-ish. There's enough humans in stores these days. There's still people walking around to help you out in stores. So I think um, that's the angle we have to think about. Right. Interesting. I mean, um, I've I've been researching a lot and like writing about the importance of focusing on the human variable, which is part of the physical <laughs> store variable. Right. And it's funny enough because I mean, like going to the store has always been a social act, at least for me, like saying hello, coming in, like thinking I know I, I everyone. I love Kmart as a, my yeah. favorite thing as a kid. Was my life going to, I, I grew up in the, I say also, also, I grew up in the 90s as a kid. I loved going to Kmart and getting my IC as a kid. That was like the thing to do on the weekend. Go to Kmart or nowadays it was like Target, get your IC as a kid. That was like my thing. My mom would walk around. As long as I had my IC at six years old, I was happy, right? And so yes. like, it was that physical like experience that you look forward to. Right. And exactly. now it's kind of, I would say, lost for some people a little bit. Yeah. A little bit lost and hopefully like uh, maybe to just circle out and uh, come back to our initial like uh, discussion point saying like, OK, we love technology and we love all things technology. However, we hope that technology will uh, help um, shift back consumers attention to the store and give him, and give them a reason to go back to the store. And I hope that we can manage to rethink ways of, of, of doing that uh, even better. And as we navigate that evolving landscape of, of retail, what advice would you offer to brands seeking to strike the right balance between the digital innovation and maintaining that unique aspect of the traditional in-store experience? Well, no, there's different types of uh, customer behavior out there. There's ones who just want the digital experience to do it all for them, from hmm. awareness to conversion. But there's also a set of customers like we just talked about that want that personable, real human experience hmm. where maybe use the digital as a gateway to get them into the store, but then ensure that the in-store experience is still strong. There's still someone available to talk to, uh, bring them to the right aisle and they have that right store associate, give them the right information about the product or service. Um, so know your customers is obviously fundamental, customer centric, but know the, the difference in your brand as a retailer of what they want in their experience. Do the best of your ability. Use data, qualitative assessments, or continuously study your customers. And so find that find that breaking off point of how much is enough digital to where I need to hand them off to a human. And that sounds easy, but it's not. But it's that's that's the advice I give. If you want that customer to have a full blown digital experience where they literally buy it online, pick it up in store, and they don't talk to anybody except for the person they're saying thank you and walking out, fine. If you want them to bring them in store to have an in store experience bridge them with enough communication and triggers to say, this is where you go and then pick it up there from a humanistic perspective. It's about guiding your customers and knowing their various behaviors that they're doing. So it's important for us to know that when we're thinking about digitizing um, our customer's journey in that uh, omni-channel context, it's not always necessary that this would lead to a trans action online. I mean, it's important also to uh, rethink um, the digital in a way that uh, helps the brand meet its objective and stay true to itself. We might think even of uh, digital as an informative platform or a gateway to a social platform, right? So it's important for us. It opens the door for you, right? It's like the door opener. Yeah, yeah. it, it, It makes me want to walk. I'm in a parking lot. I'm, not, I'm using this as more of a rhetorical example, but like I'm in the parking lot and wow, that door looks shiny. The digital thing that got me there, I want to open that door now, right? Like it's the door opener. Mm-hmm. And once I get the mindset to the customer, I want to open that door, and literally we are doing this, then let the in-store experience do its thing with all the digital touch points and triggers, but then with the humanistic of, approach as well, or whatever mm-hmm. that is. I mean, you can do that for almost any commodity. I mean, think about like a car dealership. 
you know, that's retail. Anything you yeah. sell in a physical environment to me is retail. But most people want to see the car, test drive it, but a lot of digital to get them there and then let the human connection happen at that point, right? So yeah, yeah it really depends on your product as well. And finally, uh, I don't know if we can do that link uh, between digital as digital and digital with a link on social media and social selling because yeah. yeah it's important for us to also think about these things today when it comes to that social shopping experience that one-on-one -on -one shopping experience and as you said sometimes related to brands that are not fashion or beauty but maybe other services that could be socially sold so what are your thoughts on that well, yeah, I'm glad you brought up social media because that is an outlet for digital to connect to stores, right? So we talked about mobile earlier, apps, websites, but yeah, social is actually one of the most dominant channels to use. And everybody wants to learn about what they're buying for the most part, right? On some level. So a social media presence, even if it's on a mo uh, an attractive product, right? Let's talk about it. Okay, so not beauty, not fashion. That's something that's like always visually appealing, but you want to look at what are people saying about it? What are the mm -hmm. reviews on social media? Right. And if, if you're a strong social media uh, company or you're, you're a strong uh, brand of a company that has a great social media presence, you have interaction on there. You have fo a lot of followers. And really, I can go on social media and in the moment, probably look up a Facebook account, a Twitter or whatever and say, oh, you know what? People really love this product. I'm there at the shelf. I'm about to buy it. Some people actually will do that. So have a strong social media presence and then absolutely trigger them to go to the store, offer in-store you know, coupons, in-store experiences. Um, and then when stores have like, you know, something as simple as a physical event, right? They have like a, a, a demo day or they're having like a tent sale or some celebrities coming to sign autographs. Mm -hmm. Where are people going to learn about that? Social media. So social media is that communication touch point. And then, then interactiveness too on selling. You know, if you want to sell through your social commerce, then absolutely and that's emerging too. But I think social media definitely has merit to communicate a lot of what can happen for the customer to make the purchase decision. Right, interesting. I believe that I have asked all of the questions I wanted to ask you today. Is there anything else that you would like to add to this beautiful conversation? Um, I just think, again, it goes back to the fundamentals of strategic management and digital strategy. Know your objectives, and then with those objectives, get all the data and information that you can at your disposal about your customers at the beginning of a new strategy, and then monitor it, obviously, as you go. Be willing to test things. You don't have to go full blown. I call it big bang. Test things out because if you never test it and measure it and find out if it works or doesn't with data, you're going to be missing out on probably a bigger opportunity or you're going to prove it wasn't the right opportunity, but you still did a light investment for a long term answer. Right. So I think some risk of and I, I talk about this a lot because risk adverseness is what stops digital strategy more mm -hmm. than anything yeah. else, not the investment not the opportunity it's risk adverseness it's the risk adverseness of should i do this or not as a retailer you know what take a shot and if you have enough stores to test it out do it be a risk taker but a light risk taker calculated and you may see more payoffs than you know and you may get ahead of your competition a lot faster so that's my advice i would like to plug my website is that okay Yes, please do, because I wanted actually before to conclude uh, to ask you about your latest publication and all oh, of the beautiful <laughs> uh, speaking opportunities uh, that you always go to. So like uh, and the website for sure. Okay. Like, tell all us right. about well, those, that. please. <laughs> keep it up to date. I try to keep up to date as much as I can. I'm really this year. I really started revamping it up. Uh, Doctor of Digital Strategy dot com. Um, and I'll be speaking at uh, um, the Digital Summit in Dallas. In December, uh, marketing tech conference in September. Uh, there they have a webinar or a web conference. Um, but always, you know, loving to do this. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm writing the e-commerce textbook for Stu Kent, a major publisher. So there's e-commerce courseware and book. I'm writing that. That'll be out actually a little bit later this year. And it's more for colleges and textbooks. Um, and I'm, you know, other stuff going on. So, you know, I appreciate it. Um, I have a strategic, oh, and I also have a digital marketing textbook out. Uh, strategic Digital Marketing, Modernizing 21st Century Business that I got published earlier this year. It's out there on huh, the Azon website and uh, Cynthia A major online bookstores. A major <laughs> online bookstore. I think you guys know. And then also, I'll, 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 I'll like to give a plug to the publisher, CynthiaPublishing.com. So, got a few things out there I'm working on. I um, also just uh, published a digital marketing quick study guide with bar charts. And that's like those six-page pamphlets that give you like 
quick study guides. Just did that as well. So I've been doing a lot of writing and uh, speaking coming up. And I'm also doing a lot of teaching in digital marketing strategy uh, uh, as an adjunct professor, but across several universities right now. So that's what Beautiful. I'm doing. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's wonderful. Thank you so I like much. Busy. Digital, digital is my thing. So thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you accepting uh, to have uh, this chit chat with me. Thank you so much for all the insights. And I will be sharing uh, all of the information you mentioned uh, in the description for those who would like to get in touch with you. Guys, thank you so much. And I wish you a beautiful day. <laughs> thank you so much.